Amen. Amen. Come on. Glory to God. Good morning, Ignite Church Tulsa. Come on. Make some noise right where you are. Oh, come on. Come on. Come on. We got to do a little bit better than that. I said make some noise right where you are, Ignite Church Tulsa. Come on. Come on. I need somebody who's going to talk to me today. Whenever I preach, I'm not a dead preacher. I like you guys to talk back. I need you guys to give me a little bit. Can y'all give me a little bit today? You guys think you can do that for me? I need somebody who knows how good God has been to them. I need somebody who understands the goodness in the bad times as well as his goodness in the good times. Are y'all going to talk to me or are you just going to let me talk by myself? I need somebody who knows how to give God a praise because of what he has brought them through. Because if I was by myself, if I was alone, I would have fallen and I would have never came back. But when I gave my life to Christ, whenever I gave it all to God, he carried me through. He carried me through. And because of that fact, I won't stay silent. Because God brought me through what I brought through, I have an obligation to say his name. I have an obligation to tell others about who God is. And God just dropped this song in my spirit. If you know it, I want you to sing it along with me. It says simply, and I will not be silent. I will always worship you. Come on, if you know it, sing it out. As long as I am breathing, I will always worship you. Come on, sing it out. Make that your heart's cry. And I will not be. Right there would somebody give God a hand clap of praise come on you can do better than that he's done more for you come on come on you can do better than that somebody give God a hand clap of praise in the room father God we thank you we thank you father God he's been good he's been good and I know I'm supposed to preach but I just continually am thinking on the goodness of God he's been good I can think back in the last month of moments where I was so low I can think back months ago when I was at my worst. I can think back years ago when I thought my life was over. Come on, some of y'all maybe not have been through what I've been through. I, I can't talk for you. I can't talk about your testimony. The only thing I can do is share my testimony. And God has been good to me. He's been faithful to me even when I wasn't faithful to him. He's given me grace even when I backstabbed him multiple times. God, you're good. God, you're good. God, God, you're good. You're good. You're good. Come on, come on. Let's just take a couple seconds. Come on. Give God some praise. Come on, right where you are. Just worship. Just begin to lift up in a voice of worship. You've been good, oh, Father. You've been good to me. Come on, don't look around at your neighbor. Don't look at me. This isn't a time for me. This isn't a time for your neighbor. This is a time for you to give God some praise. Father God, you've been good in our lives. Father God, you've held us, you've kept us, Lord. There's nobody like you, God. There's nobody like you in all of the heavens. There's nobody like you in all of the earth. I don't know what some of y'all are waiting for, but this is a moment of worship. Worship is not just when we sing songs, but it's when we think about the goodness of God. We worship you, Father God. We love you, Jesus. And on this day, Lord, we come before you. We come before you with a heart of gratitude. We come before you knowing, Father God, that you're the only one who could have carried us through what we've been through. Father God, on this day, I ask that you would use me, Father God. Use me in might. Use me in power. Allow this message to go forth. Allow it to penetrate the hearts of your people. Don't allow it to be me, but allow it to be your spirit, Father God. Somebody needs a touch from you today. If you need a touch, just lift your hand. Somebody needs a touch from you today, God. Use me in only the way that you can. Holy Spirit, come. You have full access. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, before I jump into what God has said on my heart today, I wanted to let you guys know that Pastor Katria is okay. 
Pastor K is okay. I know sometimes we get a little freaked out when we don't see Pastor K on the front row, but um, she is currently at a volleyball tournament in Kansas with my little sister Jasmine. They're on live, so if you guys want to clap it up for Jasmine and Pastor K, they're okay. They're just out. Jasmine's been playing volleyball. She's been doing great. Also, a little shout out, a little plug to Jasmine. Recently, she was in a competition. Some of y'all know about it. So for all of you guys who don't know, maybe for our visitors, Jasmine, she does our behind the scenes production. She's our production director. And she was in a competition for a Broken Arrow pageant. Um, and she won this pageant. <laughs> really crazy. She's never done pageants in her life. And this is the first time in 68 years that a woman of color has won inside of this pageant. How awesome is that? How awesome is that? We're so proud of you, Jasmine. We love you. And, and so if you guys want to jump online and shoot in the comment section, we love you, Pastor ja I mean, uh, Pastor Katria. We love you, Jasmine. You guys can do that. Well, I want to jump right into the word. Is that okay? For all of you guys that don't know, my name is Pastor Jamin. I'm the youth. I'm the young adults pastor here. And I'm so excited to bring you guys the word God has for me today. It's going to be good. But I need you all to talk to me. I need a little crowd participation. So if I say, can I get an amen, you say that was a little medium. That was, that was a little mid. If I say it, I want you guys to give me everything. So if I say, can I get an amen? There we go. There we go. It's going to be good. Somebody say, I got problems. Oh, somebody say, I got problems. Look to your neighbor and say, I got problems. Look to your other neighbor and say, I got problems. Oh, and the tears begin to flow. Yeah, God's coming for us today. God is coming for us today because we really do have problems, don't we? How many of you guys have ever dealt with some problems, some issues in life? Come on, talk to me. How many of you guys have ever dealt with problems and issues in life? Man, in, in, in this room, I want us to be real. I want us to be open. That's the only way God is going to penetrate our hearts today, if we're real and we're open with ourselves. And so when I say something, don't allow it to go past your head. Don't allow it to slide in one ear and out the other, but really think about what God is trying to put inside of your hearts today. Amen? So we got problems. We got problems. We got problems. Man, and so jumping into this word, I think... I think that we all have issues, we all have problems, we all have things that we go through. How many of you guys would agree? How many of you guys would agree? I heard somebody in the back say, man, if I could get a boo thing, I wouldn't have no problems. I wouldn't have no problems. Hey, I hear you back there, Jesse. I hear him talking. I hear you back there. As long as she's fine, I'm going to be fine. As long as she's all right, I'm going to be all right. As long as he got on them sweatpants. Oh, I don't know if I was supposed to say that. Oh, 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 oh. I don't know if I was supposed to say that. As long as she got on them short shorts. Come on, y'all. We're going to be real today. Let's be real. I, 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 don't, I don't like the whole, you know, dynamic where I'm up here and you're down there. I want us to be an interactive audience. And how many of y'all would say that my significant other better be fine? Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. Because when his arms are popping just right. Oh, my. Oh, my. And when the hair is looking just fine. Oh, y'all not going to talk to me today. They're not going to talk to me. I'm going to just talk to Monique and Charisma today. They, they, they don't like it. They don't like it. Y'all too churchy for me. Y'all too churchy for me. Oh, my. Whoever the Lord has for me, I'm not speaking for you, but mine needs to be fine. Amen. But honestly, I think that sometimes we get caught up in this whole relationship thing. And, and, and that we assume this, that once we obtain the relationship, then everything is going to be okay. Like, bro, once I get that baddie, then I'm going to be fine. Right? Like, I, I know I'm depressed, I know I deal with depression, but girl, like, once I get my man, I'm not going to be lonely no more. Right? Or once I get into that relationship, I won't have to worry about budgeting and financing. Like, I, I, I'm going to handle that when I get in the relationship. Or maybe once I get that job, yeah, once I get that job, then I won't have money problems anymore. I'm going to be all right, and I'm going to be living just fine. How many of you guys have ever heard somebody say that statement right there? These thoughts are what so many of us think, and we truly believe that these thoughts are truth, but I'm here to tell you that's not how it works. Somebody say to your neighbor, that's not how it works. Look to your other neighbor and say, that's not how it works. And before I go any further into the message, I want us to be willing to drop what we think we know about problems. God wants to bring this in a new light to you. God wants to bring the word problems. God wants to bring the word solutions in a different light to you today. And so what I need for you guys, I need you to be open. I need you to be open. Somebody say problems. God wants to reconstruct our thought processes today. God wants to reconstruct our thought process today because so many times we view a problem as this, oh, it's too big for me. Any issue that's, that we're dealing with in life, we're like, oh, this is too big for me. This is too much for me to handle. Oh, this is too hard. I'll never get out of this mess. How many of you guys have ever had those thoughts before? I know I have. I can't get out of this problem because it's heavy. It's too heavy on my shoulders. But God is here to tell you today that the fight is a lot smaller than you realize. The fight is a lot smaller than you realize. We as humans tend to magnify our problems bigger than they actually are. 
We do that with our problems. Any problem that we do, we magnify it. Any mess that we're in, we magnify it. Any hurts and pains that we have, we magnify it. The enemy, we tend to magnify it. And let me just say, sometimes we give the enemy a little too much credit. Sometimes we give the enemy a little too much power and hold over our minds, but God is here today to rectify what most won't talk about. And a little side note, I feel like so many times we magnify the small things, but then don't magnify the big things. Like, like, like we'll, we'll be over here and we'll be so worried about our problems, so worried about our issues, but then whenever God blesses us in a great and mighty way, we're just like, oh, you know, it is what it is. And, and to me, that's so backwards because it should be whenever I have a problem, I'm not focused on this problem. I'm focused on what God has ahead for me. And then whenever God blesses me bigger and greater than I could ever imagine, I need to make a big deal about it because I need to speak on the goodness of God. Man, we're going to go in today. And, and the title of my sermon is Heavenly Solutions for Earthly Problems. Somebody say Heavenly Solutions for Earthly Problems. Say to your neighbor, Heavenly Solutions for Earthly Problems. Look to the other neighbor, Heavenly Solutions for Earthly Problems. Man, on this earth, there are so many problems that we struggle with. Amen? And what are the, some of the things that we struggle with? I want you guys to talk back and forth to me. What are some things in your life that you have struggled with? It doesn't have to be anything too serious, but just a couple of examples, maybe injuries. Some of us have dealt with some injuries. I remember I tore something in my leg, tore something in my back. I wasn't able to play basketball anymore. It was kind of tough. Maybe some of us deal with pain. Maybe some of us deal with heartbreak, tiredness, fatigue. Throw some at me. What, do you, what are some of the things that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis? Come on, talk to me, talk to me. What's some of the things that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis? Finances? Oh my, somebody said finances. Who else got some? Addiction, education. Keep them coming. People? Oh my. <laughs> People? Give me two more. Give me two more. What else? One more time? Depression. Depression. I heard one in the back. What'd you say, Miss Clinton? College bills. Oh my. Whoo. I felt, I felt that one in the spirit. I'm a college student and I have college debt. But God's going to take it away in Jesus' name. God's going to take it away in Jesus' name. Maybe some of us deal with bad budgeting. Maybe some of us deal with not having a boo thing. Maybe some of us deal with loneliness, depression. These are the issues that we're going to be talking about today. And so with these issues that we just named, society would tell us that there's a certain way to handle them. Thank you, Chris. Some, society would tell us that there's a certain way to handle some of these issues, right? If I get injured, what am I supposed to do? Go to the doctor, right? If I get injured, I'm supposed to go to the doctor. If I have anxiety, what am I supposed to do? S see a psychiatrist, right? There are different options. We're supposed to stop. I've heard stop, take a breath, breathe, right? Whenever you're dealing with anxiety. If I have heartbreak, what am I supposed to do? Write a poem, write a song, or, or, or maybe you guys have heard of this one. Oh, go find another one. There's a billion fish in the sea. Oh, come on. Don't act like yeah, I never heard that one. Go find another one. There's a billion fish in the sea, right? Go find another one. Go find another one. If I'm feeling stress and under pressure, what am I supposed to do? Maybe some people will be like, oh, stop and reassess your priorities, right? Stop, reassess your priorities if you're feeling stressed because maybe you're doing too much. Maybe you're in somewhere that God has not called you to, but wait. Didn't God call me to that thing and you're telling me that I'm not supposed to be in that thing? Right? And it's crazy because so many times what happens is we understand worldly solutions, but we don't have a clue about the heavenly solution to things. Like, like, we're supposed to take the heavenly solution. We're supposed to be reading our Bible, reading our word, hearing words from God. But so many times we go over here and we drift towards the worldly solutions that people have for us. And we hear and we understand more about society than we understand about our own faith. We hear and we understand more about society than we do about our own faith. We'll listen to every podcast. We'll read every single book, and yet we wonder why we still struggle with the same problems, right? We'll take advice from anybody with a doctorate degree, but whenever God sends someone to talk to us, we stand still. Come on, am I talking to anybody today? Well, we'll swear up and down that God called us to be famous. Oh, God, you called me to be great. You called me to do all these great things, but yet we can't even carry discipline a fruit of the Spirit. We can't even carry love. We can't even carry patience. All of these different things. We love, love, love to take what the world tells us and not even worry about the heavenly solutions that God gave for us. Man, God is coming for our minds today. He wants to show you and he wants to teach you that the problems that we deal with are not as big as we think they are. They're not as big. So somebody say problems. Come on, let's go, to the, let's go to the Word. Let's go to the Word, because everything we do at Ignite Church Tulsa is based in the Word. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and pull up your Bibles. If you have the Ignite Church Tulsa app, you can pull up the Ignite Church Tulsa app, and we got a Bible on there. we got you covered. And if you have your notes, you can go ahead and pull out your notes, too, because God has some stuff He wants to talk to us about today. Amen? 
So we're going to go in the Word. 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. This is going to be a good scripture. Maybe some of you guys have heard it before. Maybe not. I hope it's your first time hearing it because God wants to show you some revelation. 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. We're going to be looking at the story of Naaman. Somebody say Naaman. Naaman. He was a commander of the army of Aram. He was the commander. He was the top dog. Somebody say top dog. Somebody say big dog. He was the big dog. All right? Let me know when you guys are there. Somebody say amen. All right, 2 Kings chapter 5. So we're going to start reading. Now, the, now, Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. And so he was in the battlefield, he was fighting, and through God's grace he had given victory to his kingdom. He was a valiant soldier, but, somebody say but, he had leprosy. Now, bands from Aram had gone out and taken captive of a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Somebody say, if only. If only he would go and see the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Now, Naaman went to his master, and he told him what the girl from Israel had said. And this is what the king said. By all means, go, the king of Aram said. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 settings of cloth. And the letter he took by the king read, With this letter I am sending you my servant Naaman, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read this letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a core with me? Somebody say he was scared. And I say it with some saying he was scared. Now, when Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent this message to him. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went to his horses and his chariots, and he stopped. Somebody say stopped. This is important. He stopped at the front of Elisha's door, and this is what Elijah did. It's so funny. He sent a messenger. <laughs> he sent a messenger. Somebody say a messenger. He sent the messenger to him to say, go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But, but Naaman was angry. Naaman was angry, and he said, I thought that he surely would have come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of leprosy. I, 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 I could have sworn that he would have done some great and grand gesture to come and that's what Naaman was upset about. And then this is what he said. He said, are not Abana and Parfar, the rivers of Demarcus, better than any waters of Israel? You want me to go dip in the Jordan? You want me to go dip in the Jordan? Wait, I know that there are better waters in Israel. Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in anger. He turned and went off in anger. Naaman's servant went to him and said, my father, <laughs> my father, he said, if the prophet had told you to do something great, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? Would you not have done it? How much more than when he tells you, wash and be cleaned? So he went and dipped in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored, and he became clean like that of a young boy. He became clean like that of a young boy. And so what happens in this story? We see that Naaman is the commander of an army. Somebody say the commander. He's the commander of this army and, and, and he has leprosy. And so he has this deadly disease that makes your skin as really, really white and it puts pores all over your skin and it's this deadly disease and not many people can be around you because you can infect them with this disease. And so what ends up happening is he tries to find a cure. He tries to find a cure. So he goes to the king of Israel. The king of Israel is like, man, I ain't got no cure for you. He's scared, so he sends him to the prophet Elijah, and prophet Elijah sends him a messenger. The prophet Elijah didn't come down, but he sent a messenger. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to go there later. And so what happens, this man named Naaman got really, really, really upset because he thought some great grand gesture was going to happen. He thought that to receive healing, something big needed to happen. He thought that to receive healing, lightning bolts needed to fall from the sky and a big voice saying, I am the Lord your God, needed to happen for him to get healing. He thought that something crazy needed to happen when all it was was to go and jump in a river seven times. 
Yeah, we, we, we're going to talk about this today. And, and so before, what we did was we identified some problems that we faced on a day-to-day -day basis. And what we just did was we identified this problem that Naaman is dealing with. And this problem is called leprosy. Somebody say leprosy. And so what I want to do is I want to talk about solutions. Somebody say solutions. I want to talk about solutions. Write this down. Problems plus solutions equals freedom. Write that down if you have notes. We're going to explain what this means. Problems plus solutions equals freedom. And so I want to give you the definition of what a solution is. Somebody say solution. It's a liquid, mixture, a liquid mixture in which the minor component, aka the solute, is uniformly distributed with the major component, the solvent. I'm going chemistry on y'all real quick. So listen, this is what it simply means. You have a solute. It's a substance that's really, really small. And then on this side, you have a solvent. It's a substance that's really, really big. And what happens to get the solution to complete the equation, you have to put the smaller substance into the larger substance, and now you have your solution. And so whenever I say this, problems plus solutions equals freedom, what I mean is that our problems, which are the solute, which are minor, which are smaller than we really think they are, plus the solution, which is a heavenly solution, which is a lot bigger, and so whenever you take the solute, you put it in the solvent, solvent what happens is the, the, the chemicals that were in the solute begin to disintegrate. What happens is the chemicals inside of the solute begin to disintegrate in the solvent because what happens over here is this is a much stronger, much more potent chemical than what the problem is. And so in the solution, whatever the solvent is, let's say water, must be greater than the solute to get the right solution. And so in our lives, the solvent is our heavenly solutions. The solvent is our heavenly solutions, and it must be greater than the solute, our earthly problems, to get freedom. Problems plus solutions equals freedom. Turn to your neighbor and say problems plus solutions equal freedom. And now I want to connect this back to real life because that's all we're here about. We're here about your life. We're here to talk about the things that you go through. We're here to talk about the things that you deal with. And so I want to bring some light to the subject. Our problems that we face are probably only 10% of the battle. The actual problem itself is only 10% of the battle. Pastor Jamin, what do you mean? If I get into a car accident and my car is totaled, me totaling my car wasn't really that big of a deal. I'm still alive. I still have breath. I can still move. God brought me out safely. I can live another day. It's not the fact that I was in a car accident that's the issue. The issue lies in the fact that I was too lazy to pay for my car insurance. And since I didn't pay for my car insurance, now I'm in an accident and now I have to fork over money out of my pocket. I'm creating more problems, right? And since I didn't pay for my car insurance, now I don't have a car to drive because my company won't give me a new car. Now I have more problems. Now I can't get to work. Now I can't do all these things that I need to do with my vehicle. The problem of me actually getting into an accident wasn't that big of a deal. It was the end result of my solutions that really, really drove that problem down. Let me give you guys another one. If I get in trouble with the law enforcement, right, and I have to go to court, it's not that big of a deal me having to go to court. I can go to court, I can pay the speeding ticket fine. It's not that big of a deal. The issue is when I'm fighting for my innocence, when I know that I'm truly guilty. No, I didn't speed, no, I didn't speed, no, I didn't do all that, and now you're having to go to court multiple days because they're having to do, and now it's taking time away from your work, now it's taking time away from your family. It wasn't really the problem of me getting in trouble that was the issue. It was the solutions that I used to try and fix my problem that made more problems. Am I speaking to anybody today? Let me say one more. If I accidentally make one of my friends upset, if I really, really upset one of my friends, that's not the biggest issue in the world. We're still friends. We still cool. We can still hang out. It's the fact that I hurt them in person and wanted to apologize over text messages. That's the real reason. And so it's not necessarily the problem of me upsetting my friend, but it's the fact that I don't want to use the right methods to fix the problem and to dissolve it. Am I making sense to anybody in the room today? My Bible says that if your brother has something against you, leave your offering, at, leave, leave it at the altar and go and make amends first. I know I'm in the room today. I know I'm in the room today. Problems are only 10%. They're not that big. Naaman's issue of leprosy was not that big of an issue. It was not that big of an issue for God to deal with. God could have fixed it like that. What happened was Naaman decided to use earthly solutions to try and fix the problems that he was dealing with. So I remember the equation, problems plus solutions equals freedom. The other 90% that we're talking about, this is supposed to be what creates the freedom. 
This is what's supposed to be what creates the freedom, but for many people, it just creates more problems because we use earthly solutions instead of heavenly solutions. What do you mean, Pastor Jamin? Well, I have an example. If my two people who are doing the example with me would come to the front, um, can my problems sit on my left hand and can my solutions sit on my right hand? Everybody give it up for Mike and Prosperity. Oh, don't they look so good in their white t-shirts? They look so, so great. Oh, Mike, I see you got the chain on. Yes, ma'am. Come on. We got prosperity up here. And so I'm a visual learner. How many of you guys are visual learners? I love seeing things because it just helps to clear up any ambiguity, right? And so right here, we've got a problem. Somebody say a problem. We got an earthly problem. These are the things and these are the challenges that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, right? We, we, we yelled out depression. We yelled out finances. We yelled out anger. We yelled out pain, mistakes, mess ups. This right here represents Naaman's leprosy. And the cool thing about it is, it's small. Micah is a very, very small person. And this represents truly what our problems are. They're not that big. Our problems are a lot smaller than we realize, but we tend to magnify them. We tend to magnify them. And in this spot, what do we have? We have an earthly solution. Show them your t-shirt. We have an earthly solution. And as we can see, the earthly solution is a lot bigger than our problem, right? And so in the examples that I just gave you guys, what happens is we have a problem. We have such a big problem that we feel like is big, but in reality isn't that big. And the reason that the problem doesn't get solved is we come over here to our earthly solutions and we send it towards the earthly problems and it just creates more mess. It creates catastrophe because you can't solve an earthly problem with an earthly solution. The Bible says we're in this world, but we are not of this world. That means that the things that I use to solve the problems, to solve the issues that I deal with, cannot be from the same place that I wasn't even... I'm not even from here. I, I, I'm from here, but I'm not from here. I have a heavenly father who's in heaven, who in some time I'm going to go up there and spend the rest of eternity with. And so if I want to live this life, if I want to execute this life right, I have to live by his standards, not the world's standards. And what happens over here is we live by these standards, these earthly solutions. We live by these standards, and this is what God is going to come for today. Have you guys ever heard of the term culture vulture? You guys ever heard of that term? What this term is, it's whenever one group of people takes a very prominent and important piece of rich ethnic culture from another group of people. And so one group of people steal something from another group of people. And in America, we'll get really upset about it. If you see somebody walking around in our traditional robes and our ethnic pieces, we get really, really mad. You better not play our music, yada, yada. Y'all don't want to be real today. Y'all don't want to be real today. Oh, she got, she got our hair in. Don't put her hair in. Why'd she put her? Yeah, yeah. We, we're going to talk about it today. We're going to talk about it today. In America, we'll let people really, really hear our discomfort. And yet, as Christians, what we tend to do is we culture vulture the world all day long. We culture vulture the world all day long, all day long, as long as it makes me feel good. As long as it sounds good, I'm going to go over here to these earthly solutions. As long as it'll help me, charisma, this one, suppress my pain. As long as it'll help me push it down, I'm going to agree with what's over here. Nowadays, we post more Instagram posts and Instagram quotes than we do the Bible. Nowadays, we post more quotes from somebody who has a doctorate than the master physician. And, and for me, I have a problem with that because what it says to me is it says you truly believe what's being posted. Not everything out there is real. Not everything out there is going to truly help your problems. The only thing that is going to solve your problems, and this is what God is coming for today, is our heavenly solutions. Somebody say heavenly solutions. Man, what God was showing me this week was really sad and it really broke my heart. Because as I continually scroll through Instagram, as I'm continually on all these different social media posts, it's really hard to find him. It's really hard to see God on social media. Let's be honest. Most of our For You pages, most of our Instagram pages, most of our Facebook pages and our Twitter pages are filled with anything but God. They're filled with anything but God. And this is exactly what we saw inside of 2 Kings with the soldier Naaman. He wanted to trade heavenly solutions for an earthly solutions. And in all honesty, let's be real, it was really a pride thing that Naaman was dealing with. Let, let's, let's go to the root and really deal with what Naaman was walking through. It was his pride that stopped him from getting his healing at first. He still attained it, but his pride was almost the reason that he didn't get what God had for him. And through this story, what I have is I have four things that God revealed to me that I believe is going to help us attain freedom today. 
The first thing is that what happened in this story is a girl told him about a prophet who could help him get his freedom, right? The girl, she said, if you would only go to Samaria, I know a prophet who can help you reach your freedom. But an interesting thing, and write this down, this is my first point. Naaman's heavenly solution was brought by somebody who was not a part of his camp. Write it down. Naaman's heavenly solution was brought by somebody who was not a part of his camp. And why is this such an, a, a crazy point? It's because so many times our solutions we feel are just going to fall into our hands. So many times we feel like our solutions are going to be right where we are. But what God is trying to show us through this passage is that if you want a solution from me, you're going to have to get up on your feet and you're going to have to move. If you want a solution for the problems that you're dealing with, you're going to have to put in some work. Because what happened? Naaman was out doing work. It says that he went to win battles for God. He was fighting. He was doing all the things that God told him to do. And so what happened? He ended up finding loot somewhere and they brought a slave girl and that was his solution. But it wasn't because Naaman was weeping and sobbing about the problem that he had. It wasn't because Naaman was so upset that he just sat where he was. Naaman had to get up and move. And I feel like some of us in this room have to get up and move on the problems that we have in our lives. Oh, y'all don't want to talk to me today. I feel like we have to get up and we have to do what God has called us to do. What do you need to do? You need to do the last thing that God calls you to do. You're looking for the next thing, but Naaman had been doing what he was already doing before. He had been fighting battles, winning battles in the name of Jesus, and that's where his solution came from. Many of us want to be the king like David was, but don't want to get into the field and work with the sheep. David was doing the last thing that God had called him to do. And for some of you, if you want the solution to your depression, if you want the solution to your anxiety, if you want the solution to your financial problems, you need to do the last thing that God told you to do. You need to do the last thing that God called you to do because that's the only way you're going to reach the solution. God is saying, I know it's hard, I know it's difficult, but you cannot allow your problems to cripple you. Look, look how, how small, how, how insignificant the problems are. You cannot allow these problems to cripple you because it will take away from you getting your solution. I feel like it's too much to handle. I feel like it's too much to handle. God said, I would never put more on your shoulders than you can bear. I would never put more on your shoulders than you can bear. So write this down. My next point, Naaman didn't allow his issues and his problems to cripple him. Naaman did not allow his issues and his problems to cripple him. And now I maybe want to speak to the other half of the room. I want to speak to the other half of the room. Those who didn't allow the problems to, to cripple them, but maybe got content with the problem. Like, like, like maybe I didn't allow the problem to cripple me, but maybe I did this. Jump on my back, Micah. Maybe I got crippled by my problems. And so now I'm walking around with my problems attached to me. Maybe I'm still working, maybe I'm still moving, but I can't move as fast as I want to move because I'm crippled by my problems. And I feel like today, this is what a lot of us look like. Content. Oh, I'm never going to get my healing. I'm never going to get my finances right. I'll never be where God called me to be because it's just too hard. I'm still going to move, but I'm crippled. And maybe this is what some of us in the room look like today, crippled by the problems that hold us in life. And I feel like God is coming for us today, and he wants you to understand that you cannot allow a small problem to cripple you. Yes, you can still move. Yes, you can still do normal life things, but you cannot do things at the level that God calls you to do if you are holding on to problems. And let's be honest, sometimes our mess feels nice. I've been in places where I've been depressed and I like to sit in my room, close my blinds, turn on sad music and just be by myself. We're not gonna be real in the room today. How many of us have ever been dealing with something and we're like, I don't wanna talk to anybody about it. I don't wanna listen to God. I just wanna be by myself and I wanna shut everything else out. We get so content with the problems and God is just saying, if you would open your eyes, if you would get up, if you would wipe the problems off, if you would shake it off, if you would get in the prayer space, if you would get connected with somebody who knows how to carry you out. Because God, God is saying, I have more for you. I have more for you. I have a higher level that you can attain, but you will never ever attain that level holding onto your problems. You wonder why you haven't got that promotion yet. You wonder why you haven't been taken to that job yet. You wonder why you haven't excelled in the things that God has called you to. It's because you're still holding on. God is saying, I can't do anything when you hold on because you have more faith in the problem than you have in me. We have more faith in problems than we have in the heavenly father. 
God is saying, I have more for you. Somebody say, I have more. My second point, write this down. It's actually my third point. Write this down. The king wasn't the answer, but was a step to get to the answer. The king was not the answer to the problem, but he was a step to get to the answer. And so what would have happened if Naaman had lost it and walked away from the king? He would have lost his miracle altogether. And so once we've learned and understood that these problems aren't as big as we truly think they are and we decide to set them down and we begin on our journey to healing and we begin on our journey to deliverance and we begin on the journey that God has called us for, the one thing we have to understand is that it's a process. It's going to take time. It's going to take patience. It's going to take heavenly wisdom and heavenly solutions to understand how to get and how to attain your freedom. What happens is most of the time we see a little bit of progress, but then we don't see anything else and we just give up. We go to the gym and we'll see a little bit of progress. Oh my God, my booty look good. No, no, let's be real, let's be real. Like, oh my God, I look great. And we see a little bit of progress, but in the next three months, we start gaining weight. We don't see any solutions. And what happens? We give up. Let's be real. We give up. We just stop trying all together. I don't even want to go to the gym anymore. I don't even want to do any of these things anymore because it's not working. But what we didn't understand is that it's a process and that that was only the first step that was only the first step to the solution that God had for us. Maybe Naaman was thinking this. Maybe this is what Naaman was thinking. I finally, finally put myself back out there. Maybe this is what some of you guys are feeling. I finally decided to step out on faith. I finally decided to step out on a limb. I finally decided to do the things that God called me to do, but I look and try and find a solution and look where it left me. Standing in front of somebody who's scared of my problem. The king was scared of Naaman. He was scared of his leprosy. He said, who am I? Can I kill and raise from the dead? He was scared. And maybe some of us have been put in front of people who see our problems, who see our issues, and they run away. And what God wants us to see, and what God wants us to understand that it's okay. You put your faith out there, that just shows me that you're ready. You put your faith out there because faith is the currency that the kingdom moves on. And what happens when you put your faith out there, it touches the heart of God. And God looks down on you and he says, good job. Heaven rejoices when you take a step towards freedom. Heaven is going up in praise when it sees you walking down the right path. And then when you finally continue to walk, God brings the solution right along the way. Naaman was patient. Naaman understood that it's going to take some time, and so he waited. It said that Elisha sent a letter to the king. Do you know how long it took to send a letter back in the day? They had to ride on chariots. They had to ride on horses. It took a while. That means Naaman was patient. He sat there waiting for his miracle. And some of you need to get a position of waiting. Some of you need to get in a position of tarrying. Some of you need to learn really how to wait on God, how to wait on his timing. It's not about your timing. Your timing could never bring you the solution that you want. It's only God's timing. It's only God's solution. And Naaman understood this, so he waited. And finally, finally, all you hear is a horse came. A horse came with the chariot, and it got louder and louder and louder. And finally, the answer to the solution had come. But it's only because he waited. It's only because he waited. You can't lose patience. You can't give up. You can't give up on finding the solution. It's not a dead end. It's the step to your solution. Somebody say it's only the step. God says, hold steadfast to my processes that I gave you. Some of you have journals. Some of you have things that God has written, told you to write down in your journals, and you've totally just thrown them to the side. We think that just because it's in a journal and you haven't seen anything come to fruition that it's dead. It's not dead. It's the first step to your process. God has businesses on the inside of you sitting in the audience. God has healing for others sitting on you inside of the audience. And so many times you lose patience and now you lose everything that God has called you to. But if you wait for my timing, God said, I'm sending a word. If you wait for my timing, God said, I'm sending a word. Somebody say he's sending a word. And this is my next point. Because Naaman waited, God sent Elisha with a word. Because Naaman waited, God sent Elisha with a word. And that word was the very thing that would set Naaman free. 
That word was the very thing that would allow him to attain healing and to show others that if you're dealing with leprosy, I know somebody who can fix it. And this is why at the beginning, when I said God has been so good, this is why at the beginning when I was giving praise and you guys thought that I was crazy and I was up here shouting the name of Jesus, it's because I am a poster child for the goodness of God. It's because I am a person who has seen the depths of hell. I am a person who has seen the depths that the enemy would try and pull you to. And look at me now. God has brought me through. And I can only say it's because of God. God wants some of you to be poster childs for the miracles that he can do. But because you're so scared, others can't see his goodness. Because you're scared of the process, because you're scared of what you're dealing with, God cannot allow others to receive healing through you. This is my third point. Write it down. Heavenly solutions never look like worldly solutions. Heavenly solutions never look like worldly solutions. Elisha sends a messenger. Elisha sends a messenger to Naaman. And I'm sure Naaman was thinking in his head, how disrespectful. Okay. You're, you're going to send a, 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 a messenger, a servant? Do you know who I am? Do you know the things that I've done for the kingdom of Aram? I'm the commander and the chief of the army, and you're going to send to me a messenger? They must not know who I am. They must not know what I've accomplished by the grace of God. Because it was by the grace of God. And now he's boasting in himself when he should have been boasting in God. Elisha tells him to dip inside of the Jordan, and this is what he says, aren't there better ones? Like, 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 okay, 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 you're going to send me a messenger, but if, even if you send me a messenger, at least tell me to go dip in a better river. Like, like, what about the one over there? Like, it's clean, it's got freshwater fish, like I've taken a drink from it before, it's really not. And you're going to send me over to the Jordan? One of the dirtiest of dirty rivers? Is this a game to you? Is my healing a game to you? And maybe this is what some of us have come to. Maybe we've actually come to the solution, the heavenly solution that God has brought for our problem, but we're so prideful that we can't even receive the solution. You're so prideful you won't even receive prayer from somebody who's not a pastor. You're so prideful that you won't even receive a word from somebody who's not the third umpteenth degree of a doctorate degree. God is saying, when is enough enough? When do you want your freedom? When do you truly want to be free from the bondage that holds you? You're going to have to get humble. You're going to have to lower yourself. You're going to have to forget about your title for a second. I want to bring you freedom, and you want to bring yourself titles. Right. Naaman was dealing heavily with pride. Do you not want your freedom? Just go and dip in the river. Just go and dip in the river. I know it's not what you thought it would be, but my heavenly solutions will never look like your worldly solutions. And this is why it's important to stay grounded and rooted in the word. Grounded and rooted in prayer. Grounded and rooted in our words of discernment because God will tell you if it's from him or if it's not. The thing is our ears have been too clogged with society. Our ears have been too clogged with what everybody else is telling us and they haven't been in the presence so they don't know God's voice. And so what happens when God truly sends the answer, we think it's not him, but it is him. You've just been clogged up with too many things from the world. God is saying today, you truly want to be free. Do you truly want freedom in whatever area of life you're dealing with? Naaman was dealing with leprosy. What is it for you? Think about it. What is it in your life that you need a solution for? There are things, and it's not always bad things, but we have issues. We have problems that we deal with in family, problems that we deal with in work life, problems that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And God is saying for every single problem that will ever come across your life, I have a heavenly solution that I will drop from heaven and give to you if you would only listen. If you would only understand this, that your problem is not as big as you think it is. I can handle any problem, for I have overcome the world. For I have given you power and authority over all the power of the enemy. Do you truly not think that I can fix this problem? Do you not remember what I did for your mama? Do you not remember what I did for your daddy? And you're really going to sit here and act like $10,000 is a big deal? I can only speak of the goodness of God. I can only speak of the goodness of God in this church, and my family was blessed with mass amounts of money in the matter of seconds. 
in the matter of seconds, it's nothing for God to bless you with what you need. It's nothing for God to pad your bank account, but what's missing, what's missing is your faith. Do you truly have more faith in your problems than you do in God? And maybe for you guys that understand that your problems are small, are you using earthly solutions to try and handle them? Are you coming over here listening to what the world says? Are you coming over here listening to what your peers say, knowing that they haven't been in the word, knowing that they don't go to church, knowing that they don't even love the same God that you love, and yet you're going to take words, you're going to take advice from them? You're only going to create more problems because earthly problems plus earthly solutions only create more problems. This is my fourth point. Write this down. Heavenly solutions will bring you freedom. Heavenly solutions will bring you freedom. Naaman almost missed out on his freedom. Praise you can come. Naaman almost missed out on his freedom because he had the wrong solution. His equation was off. He was off balance. He figured that if I use, if I, if I don't worry about my problem and I go and look for an earthly solution, he was walking in pride. If I use this earthly solution, man, maybe it's going to cancel out my problems, but instead it only magnified them because he almost missed out on what God had for him. He went with worldly solutions. He did what most of us have done. Let's be real. You want me to dip in the Jordan seven times? Oh, wait, 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 wait. You mean I can't get prayer from Pastor Katria? No, 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 no. I thought I was going to get my freedom today. You, you mean you want me to serve in a homeless shelter? Wait, 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 wait. You want me to go and do a food drive? I'm called to the nations. Wait, 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 wait. God, you told me that I was supposed to be a doctor. You told me that I was supposed to have this great job, this great aspiration, but now I'm here watching kids on a Sunday? No way. No way, God. No way, no way, no way. I'm supposed to be a doctor. I'm supposed to be great. I'm supposed to do the amazing things. And then many of us ask the question, what happened? Why didn't it go the way that I wanted it to go? Maybe it's because you are working with this equation. Earthly problems. Earthly solutions. And what I really want somebody to understand is that it's not about the problem. It's about how we respond to the problem. It's never been about your problems. It's been about the process that you use to respond to your problems. You can't do what society tells you because those are earthly solutions. But God is saying today, if you really want to deal with the strongholds that sometimes have latched onto your family lines, if you really want to break the chains that have been holding your life, you're going to have to jump in the river. You're going to have to jump in the river today. And the river's not always clean, it's dirty. The Jordan was the dirtiest river that was in Israel. It is a dirty river. It's not going to look nice. It's not going to be the fanciest of the fancy, but God is saying, are you willing? This solution that I give you, it's not going to sound like what everybody else is saying. I promise it won't. It's not flashy. You may not like it. You may not appreciate it. But in the end, you have to ask yourself, this question is enough enough. Am I tired of dealing with these issues? You've been going around the same mountain over and over again with the same problem of depression, the same problem of anxiety, the same problem of everything and anything that will come to your life. You've been going around and around and around, not because your problems are too great, but because you've been using earthly solutions to try and solve those problems. Maybe because you haven't understood that it's a process to get to the solutions. Because the same result with this equation is that earthly problems plus earthly solutions only creates more problems. And as I close today, what I need someone to do is I need us to attain some heavenly solutions today. Start thinking. Let God begin to bring back to remembrance things that have happened in your life, things that have, you've held on to, places that have been hurt, places that have been broken. These are the issues. These are the things that we carry and we walk around as if nothing ever happened. When your mom hurt you when you were a child, but you just forgot about it and act like it wasn't there. When your people abandoned you in a situation and you just totally act like it wasn't there and now you've held on to your problems, God is trying to bring some of those back to your remembrance right now. But what God is saying today, Jesse, if you could come. What God is saying today is I have a solution. I have a solution, a big solution, a solution that doesn't look like any solution that, I've, that you've seen before. 
it's not going to look like this. It's not going to look like this. But what it's going to look like is this. What it's going to look like is this. It's going to be bright. It's going to be unusual. It's going to be out of the norm. The exact opposite of what the world tells you is the solution that I'm going to bring to you today. Naaman wanted to dip in a fancy river. He wanted to look like this, but God is saying, I want you to look like this. And maybe you're not going to look as cool to the people around you. Maybe everybody's not going to want to hang out with you. Maybe everybody's not going to want to be in your circle anymore. But at what cost? At what cost are you willing to stay in problems? God is saying, you get too comfortable with residing in problems. I want you to reside in solution. I want you to reside in solution. This is what a heavenly solution looks like. When you work with my solution, things change. When you work with my solutions, things change. And now you don't have to have your problems carrying you, but your solutions carry you. My solutions will carry you. I will walk you through. I will guide you through anything that you need. You can rely on me. I'm strong and I can handle anything that you're going through. The world would tell us to hold on to the problems. God is saying, hold on to my solutions. And some of us in this room today need to begin to think about some of the world's problems that we've been holding on to. Some of the things that we'll never get out of. I'll never get out of debt. I'll never get out of, uh, of, of brokenness. I'll never get out of this pain. I'll never get out of anything. But God is saying, do you want to hold on to my heavenly solutions to me? It's not going to make sense to you. I'm sure that whenever Elijah told that to Naaman, it made no sense to him. You want me to jump in the river seven times? A dirty river seven times to clean my dirty disease? It doesn't make sense, but God is saying my solutions are not going to make sense to you, but if you would just follow my instructions, if you would just be obedient. And this is my last point. The price of freedom is abandoning earthly norms and clinging to heavenly norms, clinging to our heavenly solutions. There are many people in the Bible who have struggled with heartache. Many people in the Bible who have dealt with real problems just as you. I want to name a few. Let's start with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, what was their problem? They ate from the wrong tree in the garden. And so what was the earthly solution that they tried to use? They wanted to run and hide in the garden because they made a mistake. But God was saying, I have a heavenly solution for you. What was the solution? I need to kick you out of the garden. But wait, 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 wait. God, that doesn't make sense to me. Why would you want to kick me out of your garden? And God is saying, I need to start you on a path to redemption. You can't live hiding in a heavenly place broken because then you would be broken forever let's look at another one Abraham and Sarah what was their problem they couldn't have a child they couldn't conceive and so what was the earthly solution that they wanted to use I'm just going to have a child with my servant this is what the world would tell us I'm going to have a child with my servant because at least then we'll have a child not knowing that they created a problem child heavenly solution God said wait Wait on my timing. I know you're old. I know it doesn't make sense. I know it's out of the norm, but I need you to wait on my timing. And some of us need to wait on God's timing because if we don't, we just create more problems. Abraham and Sarah created more problems. They said, I'm going to have a child with my, I'm going to have a child with my servant. And it just created more problems. He was named Ishmael and Ishmael was a problem child. And although Abraham and although Sarah were willing to accept the child in the end, Ishmael was banished, never to be seen again. Ishmael had to be banished, never to seen again because he wasn't inside of the will of God. And now through your impatience, you have a son who is never going to see his father again until he's buried. All this anguish and pain on Abraham, all of this anguish and pain on Sarah, all of this anguish and pain on Ishmael because they took earthly solutions in place of heavenly solutions. A couple more, Daniel and the lion's den. What was their problem? He had haters. Daniel had haters because of the excellence that he walked in. Because of the grace of God that was on his life, people didn't like to see that. So they set him up to throw him inside of a trap, inside the lion's den. What is the earthly solution to this problem? Plead your case. You're one of the highest ranked in the kingdom. Daniel was one of the highest ranked in the kingdom. You can plead your case to the king. Tell him that you didn't do anything wrong and everything is going to be okay. He'll listen to you. But God is saying, I have a heavenly solution. I need you to go into the trap. I need you to go in. 
Wait, 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 wait. God, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for you to tell me to go into the trap that the enemy set up for me. But God is saying this is bigger than you. I need to save a whole kingdom. I need to show the world that the God of the universe is real and that only comes if you go inside the trap. I know it doesn't make sense, but this is bigger than you. My solution won't make sense because it's bigger than you. So many times we fight heavenly solutions. We fight these things because they don't make sense. But God is saying, if you would only listen, you'll get your freedom and others are going to get their freedom too. And the last one, Jesus. He had problems. Jesus had issues that he had to deal with. He had to die for all of humanity. He had to be hung so that all of the world could see. He had to take sin and shame on his back with nothing holding him up but himself. What would be the earthly solution to this? Many of us would run away from the calling. God allowed him to choose, but God said, I need this to be done. The earthly solution would have been to say, no, God, I can't do it. It's too hard. It's too much for me to bear. And God has asked some of you in this audience to take up big tasks that are too bearable for some people. Yeah, 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 I need you to connect with that person. But God, this person is not like everybody else. I know, but I need you to take it on. I need you to be the only diligent one at your job. But God, if everybody else slacks off, why can't I slack off? No, it's bigger than you. I need you to take that task on. And this is exactly what Jesus had to deal with. He had to take death in place of our death because there was a heavenly solution. God said, I need you to go and be a symbol of light. I need you to go and be a beacon of hope. I need you to go and rescue eternity. Why? I need you to take sin and shame on your back so that you can finish what Adam and Eve started. I need you to go on the cross because the cycle will be complete then. If you don't die on the cross, humanity will never have a chance to come back. I've started them on this path to redemption and you're the final step. And if you don't, then the process will never be complete. And God is looking at some of you today and saying your family has been struggling with things and dealing with things for a very, very long time. And your grandmother back in the day prayed that God would do something, that God would send an answer. And you are the very answer that God is pulling and God is saying, are you going to do it? Will you step out on faith? Because if you don't, the problem will never be fixed. You are the answer. If Jesus didn't die, God wouldn't have sent another. Jesus was the one that was supposed to do it. You're the one that's supposed to do it.